So let's maybe let's start with the, the formalities, if you like. Um, so those um, I haven't had a pleasure of meeting actually in person yet. My name is Ignaz Fisken, and I have the great pleasure to also open this um, second get together today. And I see lots of familiar faces, but also a couple of faces um, I'd like to welcome as well, actually, and and pleased to e-meet you in times of actually no physical contact and social distancing um, at best. And um, a warm welcome to all of you making um, time available. Um, some of you um, also at, at very difficult, actually, um, in, in difficult times in terms of actually time zones. So um, thanks for actually accommodating that and then being, um, yeah, being patient. We try to rotate and, and make it work for everybody, but obviously uh, there are too many time zones on this planet in order to actually find a great spot for everyone. Nonetheless, um, the um, welcome today, and I'm very glad actually to um, see that our three presenters have joined today. Um, Welcome, um, Larry, first of all, um, next to um, um, next in the far right corner on my display, at least. Um, Larry will um, talk about um, collaboration. And before doing that, he will actually briefly introduce himself because I'm quite sure he can do this much better than I could ever do it. So therefore, um, a warm welcome to you, Larry. And um, thank you, Ignace. Without any, any um, delay over also to, to Anshu and Mitch. Um, welcome to you guys. Um, really love to actually have you on board today and you will actually open today's session with a, what I believe a very, no. <laughs> a very interesting actually discussion <laughs> on um, how business development, legal project management, different functions within a law firm can actually collaborate for the benefit of actually a better overall outcome. Um, an important topic, obviously, in, in, a, in a world where, where these functions actually um, distinguish themselves more and more and tend to also actually create their own style as, as, as enabling actually business services. So welcome to you. And I would like to ask the two of you also to introduce yourself and then briefly talk about what you're doing, what's actually on your mind in terms of your daily challenges and so forth. Unfortunately, I had actually an apology from Jim Hennigan. Um, what I did not know, so um, uh, today is a public holiday in the US. So um, please excuse my ignorance, but uh, you know, this. so um, it's great in particular to, to our three American presenters to, to, um, for making time and, and being here today. Um, Unfortunately, Jim could not actually find a way to manage his three-year-old, but he'll, he'll be back on a, on a different session. The three-year-old had too many um, items on the agenda in order to make it actually work for him. And he apologized. He will also actually bring, we will figure out which um, slot he's gonna actually um, use. We'll find a way to, um, to have him talk about the latest Sali codes and give an update on where Sali stands and how this actually, um, ties into the latest thinking around tasks and activities and so forth. So um, for today, um, without further ado, we have one and a half hours. I'd like to hand over to Anshu and uh, Mitch for a brief introduction and then actually presentation. Um, you should be able to share your screen. Otherwise, in terms of ground rules, it's always great actually to have cameras on to see that there's some live people and not some actually just some names actually popping up on the screen. If you have questions, please either raise your hand or um, ask the question directly to the presenters. This is actually meant to be interactive, not just actually a, a um, front row lecture. So um, please use the opportunity and over to you, Anshu and Mitch. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having us. We, uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, it, it's interesting how this all kind of culminated into an article. Um, Mitch and I have been collaborating for years, and this is a topic that's really near and dear to our hearts. Um, and specifically for me, because collaboration sparks innovation, and that's a, a key area of focus for me at, in my current role. Um, and LPM is actually the launchpad for innovation in many ways, um, lending itself to process improvement, thinking about 
how we can explore technology innovation and, and looking for opportunities to be more efficient for our clients, including exploring ALSPs and, and thinking through um, even process mapping and how our attorneys can be working more efficiently um, and in doing so focus on higher value work. Um, and so our chapter is really a culmination of our mutual efforts to bridge the gap between our, our two departments so that we can be more strategic in the way we generate revenue, but also really impact profitability in a meaningful way. Um, and we really feel strongly that during a time of sustained remote work where we're not actually in each other's offices, we're not walking down the hall to think through um, how to solve a problem that's even more important to break down silos and to think about how we can be working collectively to enhance client service delivery. Um, so, and I personally, um, in looking at what's happening in the industry, I, I feel that the pandemic has really accelerated the need for LPM. I'm noticing that um, our clients are coming to us at a much more rapid pace, asking for estimates, for budgets, even if they're not looking specifically for alternative fee arrangements, um, they really are looking for greater predictability and transparency and efficiency from their law firms. Um, and as we all know, uh, LPM has become kind of table stakes. It's what the clients expect of, of us, but the goal really in, in breaking down silos and working more strategically with other administrative functions is to be able to enhance the LPM function and be more strategic. And so, especially in the last six to seven months, the way we pitch for new work um, has changed and we almost need a new set of processes and approach to winning new business that safeguards us from revenue leakage while meeting our clients' expectations. Um, and that we are minimizing write-offs as much as possible. So we're being as accurate as possible when we price. Um, so throughout our presentation today, we're going to focus on the crux of our chapter um, where which highlights that when LPM is embraced throughout the entire life cycle um, and is, is, um, is done in collaboration with functional groups like uh, mar marketing and business development, we can greatly enhance client service delivery. Um, Mitch, do you wanna add anything there? Sure, yeah, actually Anshu, just before I get to me, do you wanna give, a, I, I think we jump right into it. Do you wanna give a little background on your role and of the firm and and because you you had really amazing experience and I think it influences what we're talking about. Sure. Um, sorry. So um, I have been at Blind Chrome for just a little over ten years. Um, collectively, I left for a little while and came back, but um, my role has has moved and evolved, and I've worn many hats, including. Um, communications, practice management, and more recently, I'm part of the innovation and value team at Blank Grown, which is responsible for pricing LPM and innovation, um, and innovation in a broader sense, where we are the department responsible for um, advancing, um, in, for embracing innovation as a key goal in our strategic plan. Great, yeah, and I, I just thought it was it would be good background as you know I'm going to talk a little bit about the different roles in, in each of our departments. Um, so I'm Mitch Sterling. I'm a, a senior director of business development at Blank Rome, and I think from the last call, um, like many of you, a former attorney. Um, I still get the CLE credits, but um, I um, are in the U.S. That's continuing legal education credits. Um, so I uh, I had been a real estate lawyer in a prior life and. Um, always had, had an interest in marketing and, and business development and eventually kind of transitioned over to the, the business side of law firms, uh, first at Morgan Lewis for nine years um, and at Blank Rome for the last four years. Um, and a lot of my role here is um, intra-practice group collaboration, um, cross-selling. Uh, I lead our industry team effort um, under the strategic plan. I, um, I work on a number of cross-functional teams, whether that's, and we'll get to that a little bit later about um, whether that's by industry or whether that's by concept, things like blockchain. Um, Anshu and I have worked together on, on a good number of those things. But, um, so that's me, but I wanted to frame out a little bit of just kind of the background 
um, of how our departments, you know, kind of grew up, at least in the U.S. market in the last decade or so. Um, I, I think Anshu spoke a lot to, to you know, the way that LPM has become table stakes um, and marketing and business development has, has changed a lot in the last 10 years or so as well. Um, in the early 2000s, I'd say that the emphasis was for what people like I do um, would be more on marketing, brochures, bios, websites, branding. Um, however, you know, following the Great Recession of 2008, um, business development and marketing objectives changed and the focus became a little less on marketing and a lot more on business development. Um, and as LPM was thrust into its world of um, alternative fee arrangements all day, every day, uh, marketing departments became far more focused on the business development aspects of one-to-one um, -one client development, thinking about clients, as clients um, their business, their industry, how to target them, how to um, find opportunities and execute on those opportunities. Um, but I think where we came together, um, first in a reactive way in terms of the the huge volume of convergence RFPs and proposals that we were working on probably from 2008 to 2012 or 13, uh, regularly huge RFPs and proposals. Uh, we were having to work together on, on everything from pricing to workflow. Um, but then I think we became a lot more strategic um, and we realized that our, our shared goal was really not just revenue generation, because I think that's easy to say. I mean, that's really what we're, we're all in it for. But as Anshu will discuss, um, uh, I would say profitable revenue generation. Um, and that's a very different thing. Um, so, you know, we steered away from this reactionary strategy um, and more towards this proactive strategic um, mindset where we, and I'll get to this a little bit later, where we not just, you know, are forced to work together, but we choose to work together. Um, so with that, Anshu, I'll turn it back over to you to kind of, to start talking kind of through the, the heart of things. Sure. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I think, you know, I th we should go right into the, the advantages and kind of the business case for collaboration. Um, and I'll just bring up the, the slide so that we can kind of work, walk through that together, Mitch. Um, sure. I can't, I'm not, I don't have the ability to share the slide. Ah. Um, um, but I, we can just, we'll flex and um, I will, I'll just talk through it. Um, I'll see if I can pull it up. Well, no, well, so Zoom isn't letting me now, do it. Anshu. Okay. Okay, give me one second. <sighs> Let me know if it comes through. It's working, I think. Or it was. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes collaboration just seems like it's a um, it's a term that you, you may speak to because it it seems like it's something that you would focus on for your culture because you want a culture of collaboration and of teamwork, but. Um, what I, we feel like we've accomplished within our collaboration is that there's a real business case for it because you can be much more strategic um, by looking at both the numbers, the qualitative and quantitative aspects of a business opportunity um, and, and really looking at what's worth pursuing. Sometimes we're after a new, new piece of business, but it may not make strategic sense. And so are we thinking through uh, Sorry, Anshu, we were seeing your uh, Word document. Is that what you, you're meant to present? Oh, no. I'm trying to show the slide. This is also lovely. This is... One second. And I've lost my Zoom. So, you know, we're used to Teams, and whenever <laughs> I... Go to a new platform. I get um, a little 
sideways. Um, I assume you're still seeing the wrong screen. Where if you want, see? you can shoot me yeah. an email and attach the slides and I can actually open those for you, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I'm still not able to, am I sharing anything? Yeah, uh, your, your children. My, my cute little sure. kids. Um, Um, Tell me if that comes through okay. There we go. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, so back to, you know, walking through what's worth pursuing. Sometimes when we're going after an opportunity, we may not be thinking about the full picture. And so, you know, looking at um, whether this client is, is putting pricing pressure on us, whether there are significant write-offs on the work that we receive from this client, whether they are good at paying their bills. And, um, but then also beyond that, the numbers, is there an opportunity to expand the work to other parts? Are, are the, is the client in an industry where um, they are, they're going to be impacted by a certain trend um, that we need to be thinking about? Um, and then also being real, much more pro proactive in the way we pitch and, and, and respond to RFPs. Um, the way RFPs are produced now are so different than it used to be. Um, there is a huge pricing and LPM component and innovation component to many of our RFPs. And we really need to be thinking strategically through how are we communicating value? And is the price aligned with what the client's expectations are? So for example, is the client more price sensitive or is it outcome driven? And what are its business objectives? And um, are we looking at all that full round, the full picture of what the client story is when we're making these um, proposals. Um, and we need to be thinking about um, all those things collectively. And the part of the um, collaboration piece is what brings it all together. It's really important where um, I might have certain pieces of information and Mitch will have certain pieces of information or other business development folks um, that, that we're working closely with, but putting them together ends up being that we're putting really a robust and, and thoughtful proposals that lend itself to a much more uh, profitable business for us. Right. And, um, you know, just, I think that one thing that, I, that I'll add there is, is just the, um, you know, taking a closer look at our different perspectives. Um, you know, at least in my experience in, in the larger US law firms that I've spent time in, uh, marketing professionals tend to be larger, a little bit larger than what we've got in terms of LPM resources. Um, and we tend to have individuals dedicated to specific practice groups. Um, and you've got those, those managers typically in very deep um, in one, maybe two, sometimes three practice groups where they know, you know, not just the thinking of the practice group leaders, but they know who the rainmakers are in those groups, the decisions that are really driving their day-to-day -day, um, business pursuits. Um, they, you know, they've typically worked on those practice groups' business plans, whereas, you know, LPM has a really great firm-wide perspective. Um, they come in they're working with us side by side on the pitches and the proposals on um, on LPM issues, as you know, as well as pricing, um, and they kind of have a way, a sense of what's going on across the firm in a way that the marketing and business development folks don't. But there's those two sets of those, you know, two distinct sets of knowledge really just help everybody because in order to do what we need to do, not just with pitches and RFPs, but and we'll get to again, we'll get to it. Um, but, you know, strategic collaboration, you need to have, you know, both of those views in to, um, to both the, the micro level at the practice group, as well as the macro view and the, the 30,000 foot view of what's going on at the firm and, you know, what's, what's driving business decisions and operations at the firm level. 
you could almost argue that LPM is like a grassroots element to it where you're kind of on the ground, you're looking, you're do, working at the project level, but that lends itself to understanding what's happening across a practice area or across a particular industry. Um, and then, you know, looking at strategically at the firm and what the needs are um, and looking to really work towards um, coming up with arrangements that are mutually beneficial. So profitable for the firm, mitigating as much risk as possible, but then meeting client expectations. Um, and I would just point out that like, if working in tandem with um, business development marketing also lends itself to other really interesting projects that can lead to managing um, your experience database or thinking through knowledge management and even where you can collaborate on data analytics and um, DNI or diversity and inclusion initiatives that um, that the BD folks may be looking to ensure that we clearly communicate it to clients because that is a growing expectation. Um, but LPM can support those efforts by really working on the matter planning and staffing. Um, exactly, and you know one of the other things that. that that we'll get into right now is, is the opportunity to, um, to optimize workloads, expectations and results. We've touched on that a little bit, but one of the things that, that I guess is near and dear to my heart is, is client and industry specific knowledge sharing. Um, so together, you know, to the point I was saying from different perspectives, we can develop a, a really unique understanding of a client's business. Um, so in addition in the, to the move towards developing and marketing specific capabilities within a practice group, um, you know, that's typically the work of BD professionals. And um, we've worked really closely together with LPM to, um, to leverage that understanding into an industry perspective as well. Um, and you know, that's, that's especially important when you're putting together inter interdisciplinary teams of lawyers um, and thinking about issues the way that your clients think about issues, thinking about them as it impacts their industry, not just a finite business issue that you've been you've gotten a call about. So um, we regularly are collaborating on um, on industry specific uh, opportunities, pitches, seeing where we need to build out our teams, um, seeing where we have credible resources across um, a specific industry because. You know the firm is moving in a direction of of industry intelligence and um, seeing itself through an industry lens, but that's not always you know it's we're, we don't always have that kind of knowledge directly on hand, and it's usually a conversation between Anshu and I um, about experience and rates and who the right mix is. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, I mean. Mitch, I'm going to go into the next slide unless there's anything further you want to add here or um, speak to the bundling of services. No, Bob, sounds good. Okay. So this, this graphic really, I think, brings everything kind of full circle from our perspective, um, the complementary role of LPM and business development is this, it really shows this, um, I don't know what just happened. Are you, okay. It disappeared, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Is it coming through now? Not yet. No. Huh. Um. Let's see. There, it's coming back. There we go. Mm -hmm. okay. Um. Okay. I got a message that there was somebody in the lobby and then my screen disappeared, apologies. Um, so this concept of a collaborative relay um, and when you are working in tandem between LPM and business development that the complementary roles um, 
facilitate this congruency. Um, so looking at the matter life cycle, um, we can immediately see that there is this, um, this relay um, when we're collaborating in a strategic way, we're kind of passing the baton to one another seamlessly along the entire value chain, um, starting with the pitch and proposal where there's strategic pricing and matter planning, putting the right people in the right roles, thinking through the strategy. And then when we get the um, matter in the door, matter management is really heavily involved in making sure that the uh, matter is set up correctly, is aligned with what was proposed, that we're um, compliant with outside council guidelines, um, and we're communicating um, um, in real time with the attorneys on how the matter is tracking against a proposed AFA, um, and then communicating with the client as, as needed with, if there's a change in scope or just you know being transparent in terms of how their matter is progressing. Um, through the through that matter, um, and that is congruent with how the attorney might be communicating and how we might be touching the client through other client communications such as alerts, um, um, CLE, um, or other events that the firm might be holding at any given time. Um, that those pieces of communication is a way to continue to build your re relationship, um, and then coming towards the end of the matter, you know marrying the client feedback programs that marketing and business development might take the lead on with after action reviews. And we, tr we aim to do a lessons learned on some of our larger matters as much as possible with the attorneys. There's also, whenever there's an opportunity to do the same with our clients, we love to do that so that we're, we have an opportunity to learn um, where we can improve um, what we did well and um, whether there's anything that we need to pivot on for the next matter. So, you know, taking it full circle, by the time we're back, you know, proposing or doing another proposal for the client, um, we have uh, data and analysis, both on how their matter perform, um, the feedback, hopefully from the client, or at least the, if not the client, then from the attorneys. And we have all of that really great knowledge that will inform us as we put the next proposal together. Um, Mitch, anything you want to add there? No, I mean, I, I think that that's, you know, exactly, exactly right. And as is, you know, we're both getting this, you know, I think where I really zero in on this is where we're both getting feedback in different ways. My department in terms of, you know, administering client feedback interviews and Anshu's department in terms of the, um, the input from the attorneys um, day to day um, on how a matter is going or if there's a billing, you know, if there's a billing question or, um, you know, outside counsel guidelines change, it really takes both sets of understanding um, to affect change and to ensure that, you know, we deliver exceptional client service. So, I mean, that's the, you know, that's, you know, beyond the, the what we, what I had mentioned previously with, with profitable revenue generation, I mean, really what we're in it for is, is exceptional client service. And um, as clients have become so much more sophisticated and, um, and have higher expectations than ever about how a law firm what a law firm's role is in adding value, not just as um, exceptional, providing um, providing sound legal advice. That's, you know, like, again, another thing that I would say is table stakes is excellent legal advice. It really comes down to, um, you know, exceptional client service and knowing that they, they need to know that you understand their business and that you understand, um, you know, what's a priority for them the budget constraints they're operating under um, that you're seeing around corners for them. And that's not really possible with just one of our departments working on these issues. So, um, you know, the clients are going to ask specifically for business development and LPM to work together, but um, it's, it's just, it's, you know, as it, it's, it, the very least in a it's a necessity um, to, to really advance what we're trying to deliver. Um, so that's, that's all I'll add there. Um, Anshu, do I get, do, do you want me to get into some opportunities for collaboration yeah. now? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I think that, that Anshu's chart is, is really, 
you know, illustrative of, of you know, the mechanics. Um, but I think it's always helpful to have some, some real world examples of the ways that, that we've worked together outside of the pitch and RFP process, which is, you know, an everyday thing. Um, I'm talking more about special projects. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, obviously Heidi Gardner touches on and that we've, you know, we think about regularly is the bundling of services to drive new opportunities. Um, so in addition to the practice group and industry level marketing that I've, that I've talked about before, um, we're regularly looking at issues that, that are kind of neither fish nor fowl, that, that are not an industry, not a practice group, but something that our clients are facing. And I think a really good example of that where Anshu and I you know, worked together from the beginning um, was because we both saw it as an opportunity was, was a couple of years ago um, as the firm was developing a, um, a really significant capability in blockchain technology. And blockchain technology is one of those things that it's, you know, yes, there's clients that are, you know, that, that operate, you know, on a black, that, that have their own blockchain platform, et cetera, but it's really an issue um, more than it is a, a one specific practice because it touches on everything from um, regulatory issues, um, securities issues, um, technology, IP, all of those things need to kind of come together um, so Anshu and I worked together to, to build out a business plan for that, understanding what lawyers we would need to bundle those services together, um, what markets we need to be in, the rate sensitivities, um, you know, what our offering looks like compared to other firms that we were competing with. Um, and most importantly, probably is, you know, developing budget and measuring ROI, um, which we were able to do successfully um, without the luxury of, of you know, built-in capabilities that would exist in, you know, in terms of practice and matter codes on you know, a more traditional practice group. So um, that was a really great opportunity um, that you know, blended strategy and marketing and business development, but also LPM and, um, and business planning uh, in a way that no one told us to do this. We, we decided ourselves to, to do this, that to write a really solid business plan it wasn't going to be, it, you know, it wasn't going to be someone from practice management. It wasn't going to be one person from business development or LPM. It needed to kind of reflect a multidisciplinary view because one point I guess I want to make here is that the when you're presenting these things, these are not, you know, things you're doing for just one random partner. This are, these are things that make their way all the way up to the management committee of the firm and the department heads and some of the key decision makers in the firm. And they don't really care you know, not to be blunt, but they don't really care how you get there, but it needs to be a really well-developed, well-rounded approach that, that is, you know, well outside the capabilities of any one business professional um, at a firm. It really requires the level of collaboration that we're talking about um, to, you know, to, to hand them something that they can sign off on comfortably and know that we've considered all angles for them. Um, so we did, we, you know, we really do a lot there. And I mean, that's really one of the, that was really probably when Anshu and I first started talking about, wow, we should really write an article about this um, or, you know, do a webinar on this. So that was kind of how it, you know, one of the ways where we really identified the importance of what we were doing together. Um, and the other thing is um, strategic plan uh, visioning and execution. Um, Anshu and I both have a seat on the firm's strategic planning and implementation team. Um, we have different perspectives. Um, again, coming from what we had talked about with, you know, practice group knowledge versus project knowledge and firm knowledge. Um, but together we're working to set the firm objectives um, and realistically um, execute on them. Um, and, you know, we're, we're working with a big group of lawyers and, you know, we're some of, you know, we're, we're in the minority as business professionals in, in terms of, you know, being, having a seat at that table, but we've, I, I think we've successfully demonstrated our value to that group and our ability to think about things a little bit differently um, and to propose, you know, real world solutions um, and talk through, you know, some big scary changes or, or, or you know, going in a new direction um, and giving the lawyers some comfort around that. So um, Anju, I know you've got some other opportunities for collaboration as well. Um. Yeah, how are we doing on time? I feel like we've been 
do we yeah. want to open it up for questions? We have other thoughts on how, you know, opportunities to collaborate, but to the extent that um, anybody has specific questions, we're happy to open it up now. Any comments or experiences from, from the audience? Um, I'll take a stab. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mitch and Anshu, um, you know, I first heard you guys when you spoke at an LMA webinar, um, and I was wondering whether the two of you have any kind of ad hoc or strategic plan for continuing to get your word out, because, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so excited you're here is you represent best practices to me and um, you know, socializing other firms and your peers and competitors about what, what started out probably as personal choice, chemistry and common sense, you know, has really turned into a competitive advantage for your firm by having the two of you working together. So I'm wondering one, um, where will we be hearing from you next? And do you have any plans for that? And secondly, um, what have you seen among your peers slash competitors and other firms in making the inroads that you've been able to do so successfully? Um, I, I mean, I'll take a shot at it first, Anshu, but please, please jump in. Um, so, well, I think that this was a really nice, natural next step um, for us, Aileen, uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, kind of going to a, a much broader global audience with our with our message, and and thank you for you know uh, the necessary introductions. We um, we you know we've been we finished you know we did our draft of our chapter, so that's been that's taken some time. I um I, in terms of next steps, um, I actually just got the email again. The one that the one that kind of begat all of this last year was the LMA's call for speakers. So um, I was actually thinking. I haven't even, Anshu and I haven't even talked about it yet, but whether there's a sequel in the works or a part two on that platform, um, of course, we'll be, we're open to further suggestions or opportunities. Um, you know, if anybody has any ideas, we, you know, we've, we've certainly, um, we've certainly continued since our presentation in June or July to, to work together regularly, um, especially on the strategic plan elements um, in terms of our competitors um, and in terms of what we're seeing, um, you know, I think that in this, in this current COVID environment, maybe I've had less opportunity to, to network the way that I would have um, in terms of, you know, the side conversations that would have happened at a live event. But um, I do have a few folks on my list in terms of um, that I'm meaning to reach out to and, and, and kind of um, continue to, uh, to, hopefully develop more best practices, you know, together around. Anshu, anything you've got? You know, one of the things that I find that law firms struggle with is even collaboration within the pricing and LPM functions. And I would love to see there to be less of a gray area and, and even more collaboration there, because I think when the two are working together, um, then you probably are have, um, stronger matter planning and then that in in and of itself results in better matter management because you've thought through it um, in terms of uh, what our what we're seeing in terms of our competitors I don't know that they're proactively um, breaking down the silos with other administrative functions I I do think that we are unique blank Rome has a, a very unique culture it's really special um, and I think in this case, you're right that there was a sort of chemistry that um, resulted in our in a friendship and then more professional collaboration. But I do think that it's something that can be replicated if you are thinking in that way and having an open mind about where, as you're implementing LPM, where other cross, uh, other departments can help you both. Um, in terms of your change management, but also enhancing everything that you're doing in the LPM space, um, having better data that you know helps you with your matter planning, um, tying the work that you're doing with um, your experience database, um, whatever it is that you're doing, um, 
working in a more professional pricing proposals with, you know, that the whole package that you send to your clients um, have, you know, the same kind of voice um, between um, uh, marketing and LPM and pricing. Um, and that once that work is in the door, that that conversation continues and you're constantly thinking about new opportunities to expand work or scaling back when you are noticing that this might not be the right fit for your firm. Now, we're not saying that you, you know, you fire firm uh, clients that are not profitable, but there's always an opportunity to improve profitability and knowing that both on the pricing side with NLPM um, and working in concert with the marketing and BD folks who are a little bit more on the front lines, I think adds a lot of value. I could just uh, chime in just for a second. Uh, I also work at a large law firm um, in the uh, LPM group. And I think it's really interesting in the industry as a whole to see a lot of experimentation with how to align uh, pricing LPM, uh, business development. Um, and I think a lot of firms and kind of other providers are experimenting with, uh, you know, what kind of sets of alignment work best. Um, and the firm that I've been at, uh, we originally had uh, very separate kind of discrete functions and the pricing and LPM function kind of came together within a finance group. Um, and then both of those teams kind of moved into a client development group uh, for exactly the reasons you were talking about earlier in terms of you start working together on pitches and proposals, and then you kind of see the value of continuing those conversations and really being more proactive um, as you're planning for kind of doing all of these things better, so. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, it's uh, it's always interesting to hear you know some different perspectives and large law firms. I mean they're they're similar and then you know my the experiences that I've had it too. I mean they're very they can be very different also in terms of you know how Morgan Lewis's approach to to LPM was very different than Blank Rome's and you know departments and chiefs. It's all structured so differently, but I think that the goals are all the same. So um, so yeah, the, that's interesting. One thing maybe from, from this end, I mean, I remember um, my time, pricing was actually sitting in business development, funny enough. So legal project management was actually reduced more to sort of the planning function and overall practice management. And one of the things we, I think we've never actually managed to figure out how to do it actually um, in a most efficient and effective way was clearly how to rope in finance. So there was an understanding between the LPM function and the BD function in order to, to bring it together in terms of client value and then sort of delivering the what has been actually promised um, during the, the pitching stages. But finance never actually uh, bought into the story. I mean, in particular, those actually looking after managerial accounting, the cost center structures and so forth, and sort of adding anything. So what's your um, actually take on, on, on this aspect? I mean, have you made any yeah. observations in that regard or found any solutions most likely? Anshu may have more. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Anshu. Yeah, so the, for us, the LPM function is relatively new. Um, it's about, I've been in the role for a year and a half now. Um, and so while there was a pricing infrastructure, the LPM infrastructure we've been building. And we, um, and when I say that, I mean, you know, we're re really great at getting the matter planning done and getting the proposals done. But then once the work is in the door, making sure that we have systems in place to really track and uh, against budgets and automating um, notifications. And that requires a lot of collaboration with finance, with our business intelligence teams. Um, and so that's what I love about the LPM function is that we're constantly looking for process improvement and breaking down silos because um, for LPM to be successful, we need to be speaking the same language with the intake team, with the billing team, and the marketing and business development team. Um, and it's kind of like the entire value chain from when we pitch the client to when the client sees the bill, because even the bill is a way that the client experiences us. And so we need to be thinking holistically about it. Um, so 
we aim to be very transparent within the cross-functional group as, as a general rule of thumb, because in order to, for the role to be successful, um, we need their support. And, and one thing, just to pick up on that last point of transparency that, that I think is one of the great things that our firm does is that the business developers have full access to the finance databases. And we can pull and manipulate that information along client lines, along multiple ways. And um, not every firm does that. Not every firm is willing to turn over the keys to that. Um, you know, the, I guess the look, the, the transparency and the view into that. And it, it's, it's a, you know, there could probably be a whole other story about collaboration with finance in that, you know, we have at least the, the more senior folks on the marketing and business development team can see without even having to pick up the phone um, exactly any kind of reporting that they need to make the business case for why we should focus on a certain client or a certain industry um, or see what's working and what's not working so that we can enter the conversations with LPM already equipped with you know, enough knowledge of what's going on to be dangerous and to start the conversation at a, a higher level. Um, and the, one, the only other thing I'll add, and I, I think it works into the, the broader presentation is, if there's another development I think um, that's been interesting for me is working with IT. Um, and Anshu touched on this a lot in terms of the tools that we can develop. Um, you know, everything from certain kinds of dashboards to um, how we're categorizing matters for, you know, reporting purposes. Um, a strong relationship with IT is, is, you know, another really important element here. I mean, Anshu and I are talking about our specific, you know, two, you know, department collaboration, but that collaboration is supported by the collaboration of other departments um, as well that, that make it possible. So, um, you know, I, I think that maybe as a practical takeaway is maybe you're, you know, maybe it's not LPM and BD that works, you know, perfectly together at your firm, but maybe it's LPM and IT or LPM and finance. And I think that these lessons are, are highly transferable um, in terms of, you know, looking for where, you know, to Aileen's point, where you have that chemistry, um, where you have an easy place to start um, in terms of um, building a relationship, because I, I think that, that you know, one of the things that we we're gonna to get to, and I know we're already tight on time, is, is so much of it, is, as, as some of you have keenly observed, is about the relationship between the people wanting to work together. So if you don't have it in the LPM BD space, maybe you have it in the LPM IT space or you know, any other combination. Um, and I think that you can find success in any of those, um, in any of those collaborations. Aileen. Yeah. Yeah. Helga. Well, no, Helga, if you have a question, you go because um, I've already spoken. I'll come back. You expanded your quota for now. <laughs> yes. It's not a huge question. I, I was just wondering, I've just come from a, a client based role. I was um, the head of LPM at Barclays for a while. And um, I was just wondering what your view is around sort of LPMs and client interaction and how much are they part of your relationship teams? And do you think that they do, should, and indeed do um, enhance those relationship teams? Um, well, for us, we're starting to, um, we're definitely client facing. So we work directly with the client, both to provide just general project management support, or um, if we're dealing with procurement on the client side, then they prefer to talk to a business professional who speaks their language. And so, you know, often I will either liaise directly with the pricing or a procurement person, or I'll liaise with the GC or associate GC who has any questions about how something is tracking. Um, our, our philosophy is that, you know, communications is the cornerstone of our LPM effort. And so, um, the attorneys actually appreciate having us in the room sometimes so that we can speak to the um, legal ops folks who are in the room, the finance and the, uh, the procurement um, professionals so that um, there's a meeting of minds there and then they can focus more on the sub substantive legal issues that are being discussed. Aileen, your turn. 
You're muted. I was actually going to ask um, a question about one of the other stakeholders. We haven't talked about the lawyers. Um, um, you know, I mean, the area that I've spent time in that has been very controversial is with the after action reviews. Um, you know, because people immediately assume that it's not about lessons lost, learned and about improvement, but it's about finding fault. Um, you know, nobody wants to ask a question they don't know the answer to uh, when you're dealing with lawyers. So I just would appreciate it if you would make some brief comments where those stakeholders fit in. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'll start out because I mean, the, the client feedback efforts in the formalized client feedback efforts live in my, in my department. Um, and we really developed a campaign, you know, that is, you know, one, we've tracked our, our revenue as it relates to client uh, feedback interviews and, you know, can show a very clear uptick um, in the number of engagements and the revenue that comes as a result of, of those interviews. Um, and we basically built our own internal marketing campaign to the lawyers about that. Um, you know, we don't have a huge focus on client teams. Um, culturally, that wasn't something that really aligned with, you know, the way that the, the firm is highly collaborative, but the client team thing um, doesn't work at every single firm, but rather we use some of the elements of client teams and into kind of a more strategic account management focused role so that it's not quite this large interdisciplinary thing like an industry team, but it's really more about taking a close look at individual clients and seeing what their needs are and seeing when is the right time to do a client feedback interview, not just based on um, when matters are occurring um, as a post-mortem, sometimes as a post-mortem, but sometimes if a, a client looking at the client and understanding their business and understanding when they're at a pivotal moment in time where you know, we need to know more, you know, if there's been change in their department and we want to know kind of what they're thinking, or we know, you know, we see an uptick in a certain type of litigation um, and we want to have a conversation about how we can better help them. So, um, so we're able to make, we're, we're right, you know, your, your point is absolutely well taken. We're very, um, we're very, cog um, cognizant of when we need to make the business case for a client or a formalized client feedback interview. And we actually do it in a variety of ways too. So we have like, you know, I learned this from a, a lawyer. I, I, I like this expression, a lawyer I used to work with, who says it's basically a one size fits none approach. And that mm -hmm. sometimes it's, um, it's our chief client officer that conducts the client interview. If it's a certain, um, if it's a certain type of situation, sometimes we use an outside um, firm to do interviews. Sometimes it's our CMO, um, and we, you know, we kind of present these menu. This one, we make the business case, and we also give the lawyer as a stakeholder the option of, you know, what what works best. And we're not in the business of twisting anybody's arm, but we are in the business of of making the case for what, you know, if we believe that this is something they should do telling them exactly why we think they should do it and the kind of success that could be on the other side. Um, I can speak to more of the financial performance side of it. So one of, one of the roles that we have is a uh, billing chair who has to approve, approve major write-offs. And so when those approvals have to go through his desk, he um, is very poignant in his questions about what happened with that particular matter and is, is a great champion of the pricing and LPM team specifically and asks, did you work with the team to scope this? And did you have the assumptions in place? Because if you're coming to me with a major write-off, hopefully there was an opportunity to um, you know, make a case. And most of the time when that happens, it's because the attorney gave a back of the envelope estimate to the client that who is now holding us to a cap. Um, so going back to kind of the change man management of it, um, when it goes through that leadership um, approval process, then we're, we have an opportunity to say, okay, well, what, when, what happened with this particular matter? Where are there opportunities to improve? And 
you know, oftentimes our billing chair will say, okay, I will approve this, but in the future, um, you have to work with our, with the team in order to get this right. Um, because if we have it in writing, then we can go back and say, actually the scope changed or our underlying assumptions changed and we can make the necessary pivots along the matter. Um, and also it's when we have the actual document that we can go back to the client and say, did we meet your expectations until we have that? And we that's a best practice, I think. Um, it's really hard to do the after action reviews. Um, we do get feedback from clients at the end of the matter. Um, sometimes unsolicited. Um, and we look for opportunities to have those open conversations on, on how things kind of ran for that particular project. Um, we also sometimes get feedback from the client without asking where um, we've had an arrangement in place for a while. And they say, you know what, our competitors are offering X and they're doing this for us. What can you offer? So that, that's also an opportunity to kind of make pivots in the way we're delivering and the way we're pricing, think of ways that we can um, be more cost-effective. So, it, you know, that's kind of a roundabout way of saying that there's af after action reviews kind of pre, during, post, um, based on what's happening with that particular client and that matter at any given moment. Um, I'm sorry, but I have to run. I have. Yes, I, I was about to say. I mean, the um, thanks for for making the time today, and and great insights. I mean, the session will be recorded for those who have missed it, so um, there will be an opportunity to actually just uh, yeah for you guys also to catch up on the second part of it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights actually with us and. Uh, yeah, the um, Aileen, you ask what what can be done actually with um, others, and and you know, since Larry actually is uh, teaching LPM at Vanderbilt, I mean, Larry, how do you in, uh, incorporate actually those insights into your um, coursework? I mean, is there an opportunity that you see? I do, and um, a lot of the things that I've heard, and I can't thank um, Mitch and and Shu enough because to illustrate what a forward-thinking law firm can do like Blank Rome is a, an encouragement to those of us who work in the, the drudgery of trying to change a very impervious system that has done really well by people uh, economically. It was, as um, I think Suskin has reminded us, you can't tell a room full of millionaires their business model is broken because it's worked so well, it's very difficult to adjust expectation. So most of us work in that realm of trying to persuade people to do something different that they've never experienced. And without reason to do so, nobody changes. There were some phrases that kept coming up in your sharing with us, Mitch and Anshu, that I just want to reiterate. And the first, of course, the whole topic of this time together today is collaboration. And it is an off misused word that uh, stands for a lot of things that really aren't collaborative. Uh, much collaboration really looks like um, you do what I say and we'll get along well, and now we're collaborative. Well, that isn't, of course, collaboration. So uh, to, to Ignaz's point, uh, at Vanderbilt Law, we created a program. I helped co-found the program on law and innovation, and it's more than just the mechanics, it's really about the mindset because there was a great question asked by uh, Harold about the problem of disrupting the traditional law firm and convincing them to collaborate. And he asks pertinently, is this a generational problem? And I don't think so. I think it's a mindset problem. And when we, as referenced in the conversation prior to now, have people who are oriented to thinking differently about how to get things done well for economic benefit, that's an opportunity. I was very encouraged by reading the work of Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm as a, uh, as a disciple of Christian Claytonson at Harvard business school 
he helped me see that our work is really not focused on those who are unwilling to change because the status quo is working well for them. But it's, it's a focus with people who have crossed the chasm of, of doubt and have embraced an opportunity that they perhaps have not experienced before, but are looking for help. So when I realized that my opportunities to help change this very intransigent system resided in those who have already crossed the chasm, my life got a lot easier. And I, that's what you heard Mitch and, and Anshu say. They're not trying to change the ocean by boiling all of it. They're reacting to the places of need and they're building the data to demonstrate the process is of economic value. You, as Deming said, you can't improve something you can't measure. And when they can now go back to the executive team and show them that these initiatives are actually improving the economic well being of the firm, there's not a lot to argue with. And in the process of that, people will cross the chasm. Of that, I'm sure. The inevitability of this shift of selling time to selling value is inevitable. It has occurred in every other industry. We're just the outliers in law. Our clients will continue to put pressure on us and in some jurisdictions more pressure than others. Uh, I, I have a lot of opportunity to work with people in the UK and they've crossed a chasm in terms of understanding the business methodologies that will better serve law firms and clients are really grounded in efficiency. Legal project management is a far more familiar phrase to the folks in the UK legal service industry than it is to ours, because we're still very firmly fixed on the economic value of selling time. And um, there are a couple of other phrases that I, I just wanna to touch upon that I think are key to finding that alignment that allows us to help change an industry. And one of those was change management. And Shu mentioned it, Mitch Man, uh, mentioned it. If we're not in the business of knowing how to change institutions, which doesn't happen globally and in one fell swoop, it happens where there are people whose influence is significantly uh, appropriate to change the ecosystem within which they work. If they happen to be early adopters, then there is our opportunity. And as we build that momentum, we can continue to build the data that makes that change pers uh, persuasive to others. So I, I just wanna show a couple of uh, slides. Uh, if you don't mind letting me, I would appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Us. <laughs> so okay. it should work now i hope okay let me try there we go let me um get to why is it not showing you know the technology always gets us doesn't it let me find okay let's see okay are you seeing the same screen, yes. Okay, good. Well, this word of collaboration has come to mean something radically different to us over the last nine, 10 months. If we were to talk about collaboration a year ago, we would not have experienced COVID. And as a result of our journey into massive collaboration and the digital tools that allow us to do so, two things have happened. We've become as an industry, more familiar with how technology can be of assistance and more open to its use. But we've also incredibly enhanced the degree to which digital data is being generated at an exponential level. Uh, there was a time last year when it was projected that by the end of next year, digital data would double every day. Well, that has now happened in less than six months because of the incredible 
reliance that we've had with respect to internet. This is an interview. I'm not going to play all 17 minutes of it. You'll get the slide. I encourage you to take a look at it. Richard Tromans, a friend from the UK who calls himself the artificial lawyer, uh, interviewed the CEO of a digital transformation firm, a former lawyer, who's talking about this moment in time when digital data has become for most of the business world and will become for law a fulcrum point. So let me just let you listen to a few minutes of the opening of this particular interview. Hello, uh, Richard Tromans here again at Artificial Lawyer TV. Um, today we're talking about the digitization of in-house legal teams. Uh, with us is Sarvar Mithra, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of ContractPod AI. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hey, Richard. Great to have you on the show. Um, you probably know more about how the in-house legal teams of the world are transforming than many other people because they're your client base and you're, you're working with them every day. So first of all, let, let's just sort of set some basic terms. So what do we mean by the digitization and transformation? of an in-house legal team what, and what does that actually look like yeah no well firstly thank you for the time and happy to be here uh, for sure and uh, let's dive into digital transformation i'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible but hopefully give you a couple of points here briefly i mean when we think about digital transformation uh, it is a phenomenon by which uh, firstly businesses are able to digitalize and in many cases automate their data and processes uh, by adoption of technology. Uh, digital transformation also in now in the new modern world is all about a new operating model which has technology at the very center if not a technology first adoption model for sure. Uh, and Another final point around digital transformation in general, which most of us sometimes forget when we get into these programs is that it's a change management program. Uh, and more specifically, it's culture change uh, within, within organizations. Uh, and you know, that's, that is quite, uh, quite something to achieve. Uh, and I think sometimes all of us get obsessed with just the technology aspect of it and but forget, you know, the change management side of it and culture management side of it. Uh, it's certainly uh, something to keep in the mind. And when I talk to customers and customers talk to us, that's pretty much in the front and center of their thinking, how will this work? Uh, and you know, specifically with lawyers, I mean, I'm, a, I'm trained as a lawyer by background, I was a corporate M&A lawyer. Uh, and you know, we, were, we were trained to be risk averse, uh, us law. Uh, so I think when we think about digital transformation, there certainly is the fear of failure uh, getting into it. So I think it requires a lot of thinking uh, before getting into it. And that's what certainly I recommend to customers. And when we've seen successes happen with digital transformation, it's where really folks have thought about this. They've thought about change management. They've talked, thought about adoption. They've thought about how do you incrementally do digital transformation as well. So let me stop at that and um, just think for a moment as you consider technology. The Gartner organization, for those of us who are tech geeks, has created what it has relied on for a number of years to analyze legal technology and its state of readiness for the industries that it seeks to serve. As a, as a technologist, and I am not one, I'm not a computer engineer, I'm not a data scientist. I just love people who are and try to understand and work with them. You can be pretty enamored of the, your next big thing. And technology tends to go through this hype cycle, which Gartner has well uh, articulated over time. And to my knowledge, for the first time, took a look at legal technologies this year. 
And the cycle references, if you can see at the bottom, there is a trigger that an innovation generates, but it quickly creates inflated expectations of its success. And that's a rapid rise. So whether it's blockchain or cryptocurrency, you name the particular kind of technology, it's followed this path, but after it reaches the peak, it falls into this trough of discouragement or disillusionment because it doesn't meet those hyped expectations. AI, alternative or artificial or augmented intelligence, however you want to define it, was such a technology and is such a technology. But what they then provide is an analysis of technology that's been around enough to meet the market needs in ways that the market wants it to, to practice its solution. And that's the slope of enlightenment in order to get you to the plateau of productivity. Those are all their phrases. You can take a look at this analysis by going to the Gartner website and it's a, it's a free uh, analysis. But what they've identified in this is that in this time, and it's really, I think, attributable to COVID and our remote work, the technologies that are now becoming market ready include legal man matter management, enterprise management, which is uh, an organization's managing the tools and technologies that are beneficial for the business purposes of the enterprise, and then integrating those that can help achieve the business purposes. That's not a single platform, but typically a combination of platforms and technologies, but they're business specific to the organization. And predictive analytics, one of the most powerful parts of the AI family, as well as process automation, in Gartner's view have now reached the point that the legal industry is ready to adopt them. And I think that's an enormous challenge and opportunity for us. But going back to the Jeffrey Moore analysis or analogy, none of this is going to make sense to the vast majority of legal professionals. And when I use that term, I mean everyone in the legal industry, whether they're business development, marketing, um, professional development, IT, anyone working in the industry sector of law, in my view, is a legal professional. It's those that have awakened to the idea that things can be done better, faster, cheaper, with greater profitability. Those terms don't have to be mortal enemies. And this is the moment in time for, thus, for those of us in legal project management to become more persuasive in our ability to show the value, not merely of technology. Technology never solves a problem. It can only support those who are trying to solve a problem. And so where problems arise within a legal department in a corporation, which tends to be the most innovative segment of our profession today, or in a law firm like Blank Rome that is recognized, it needs to be uh, recognized among its competitors and clients as a law firm that gets it and is doing things differently. We have an enormous platform from which to encourage collaboration. And uh, because I've been invited to do so, and, and Ignace is uh, incredibly kind, I want to introduce you to a technology that was built by a lawyer, oh, that's me, who is a legal project manager, and who teaches legal project management, along with my colleague who is a PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence. If, if you would like to be a part of our beta test, which will run from now until the end of the year, you can go to that website, dashforlaw.com and fill out the Google form and we'll get back with you. But when I say beta user, I, I need to be very clear. 
Dash is not ready for the market, but those who are sophisticated market users can help us make it ready for the market. And our goal is to do so by the 1st of 2021. So if you care to join us in that, it would be deeply appreciated, but that's your choice. And we'll talk if you choose to do so uh, about how you can get there. So let me just give you a very, very brief um, exposure to Dash as it functions. Let me see if I've got the right view. I do, I think. Are you seeing the screen now? Are you seeing the, the Dash screen? I want to be sure. Ignace, can you let me know? I can see it, yes. Okay, good. So let me quickly show you the core functionality of Dash by simply logging in. You may choose any number of views as your default. I choose to go to the performance page because what it provides me are looks at how matters that are under my purview are responding economically and in terms of performance. So the coloration is significant because if it's green, it's a task or a collection of tasks in progress. If it's pink, it's blocked. And this is language that as legal project managers, we fully understand. And then we can also look at its budget performance. And these are aggregated numbers, which if we choose to discover what's beneath those numbers, we can click and we can see the tasks that are in that state or have performed to that level. So that's my choice of the beginning, but let's look at others and go to the task board, which you should find familiar because this is the Kanban view that enables us to see both by due date and by status, the tasks that we have knowledge of or responsibility for with the capacity to shift and change in any of the swim lanes that we've created. And if you need more than four, you can. I like to go with open tasks, those that are in progress, meaning they're being worked on, those that have encountered some obstacle that needs to be addressed, and those that are done. And that's yet another view. And throughout the system, you can see your tasks listed in list view, in calendar view, in Kanban view and in the aggregate in terms of how they're performing. And it's a template based system so that you can create templates for any set of tasks or if you have templates, populate them and you can drive planning through the use of templates. For example, here's a deposition template, which as I can see uh, has a number of estimates in terms of its uh, economics. So let's add a matter, create a new matter, but based upon the deposition template. So let's just say that this collection of tasks is the deposition of a key, a key witness. That's the task. But because it's a template, you can also choose the client to whom it belongs and you can choose the relative degree of status. You can also begin, if you care to go to this detail, provide an estimate of the work effort that references hours. And you can choose the firm if you were a corporate client and you can choose the due date that this set of tasks has to be completed and because it's a template, it's going to incorporate all of the other components. Is this a litigation? Yes, you can choose a priority. You can choose who's responsible as a lawyer or administrator or project manager. I'll make myself responsible. And I imagine that the total billing for this set of tasks will be about $4,500 and it arrived on today's date, and it is intended to 
um, be accomplished according to, I forgot something, sorry. It, according to the time frame that you've built into the system. So um, I won't go any deeper into it. You can see the tasks, you can see all of your matters, you can see all of your clients and all of the firms with whom you might have any relationship. And in all of these pages, you have the opportunity to do a search. Um, if you can't find it readily, if it's not visible, uh, you might look for a firm by a name or a contact, and it will show you those clients or law firms. If you have them, you can find them. If you don't, you add them. So I'm gonna stop because we're close to the end of our time. Um, just point out two other things that the system does, and that is to get out of email, you can message people uh, related to tasks, related to matters, or just individually. And you can also create online meetings through Zoom or Twilio or inter, uh, integrate with other platforms that you might be more useful, uh, such as Teams. So I'm going to stop and uh, let you all take a shot at me and ask any questions that you may have and uh, invite you to join this journey with us if you choose to do so. Thank you, Larry. Then other questions I have one for you. I was wondering how the AI component uh, would actually um, add to this. I mean, just give us an idea what you plan to do with AI in, this, in the context of uh, this project management tool. And I didn't even pay you to ask that question, but thank you, Ignace. That's the perfect question. Well, um, as my remarks indicated my co-founder is a PhD in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and so it's the data right so as you think about the digital data that a law firm that a legal client particularly a legal department in a corporation has generated over time there are treasures to be found there and artificial intelligence through machine learning, natural language processing, and a variety of its applications allows that data to be converted into predictive analytics. It allows it to be converted into suggested automations. So for example, if you were generating data in a tool like Dash and you're looking for efficiencies, Dash can inform you as a project manager, who's the most efficient doing a particular task? Who has the most experience doing a particular task? You might even find their economic assessment of value. In other words, if you were to do this on a fixed fee, Sally is doing it at a rate of time that is far more profitable than Sam. There, there are endless applications for AI where you have data. And as collected, that data in many cases is structured, but most data is unstructured, meaning it hasn't been categorized. So two of the components that we are bringing to Dash include GPT-3 technology. If you're familiar with GPT-3, it is a phenomenal advance on the ability of artificial intelligence to parse data that's contained on the internet using as many as 800 million variable variables, which to a technologist is an incredibly large number of parameters, um, which is contrasted to maybe 8 million in most artificial intelligence applications and do so at an incredibly rapid speed. So with respect to searches of internet data, GPT-3 is a massive tool that is being refined. In terms of unstructured data, we are also collaborating with uh, a group that uh, has generated an unstructured search tool called Agnes, which can now be focused on the unstructured data. Think billing data, think process data, think product uh, improvement data, all of that contained in unstructured data files, which 
an Agnes type search engine can allow you to process and formulate and then bring the value of that information to bear on the way in which legal services are delivered. So until the data is there, the AI uh, usefulness is, is of no value, it can be the best algorithm ever written, but it has to have data that it can access. I hope that answers your question, Ignaz. We're looking forward to it. it looks, um, sounds like a lot of work still ahead of you. There is indeed. So we have we'll... uh, just on that, I'll, I'll quickly note that um, the UK Law Tech or Law Tech UK has just announced last week access to um, a sandbox, as they call it in technology. And that is the legal data that law firms can allow a user like Dash to access to perfect the way in which it searches that mm -hmm. data for information that would be of value to project management, for example, or from a corporation's legal department. So if we're granted access to that sandbox, the combination of GPT-3 technology and Agnes Unstructured technology will really empower a great deal of predictive analytics to come out of the data. Great, so um, we'll hold you to your word and we'll actually sign up and, and beta test your software. I we'll appreciate you feedback very much. And then um, looking forward to it. Is there any more questions otherwise? looking at the clock and you know last time we said we're not going to time box any meetings but you know we should actually sh demonstrate some um, additional um, recognition for velocity and uh, also improvement continuous improvement so therefore mm -hmm. if there's none um, i'd love to um, thank you all for attending um, as i said we were gonna um, uh, we were gonna post a recording so there's a youtube channel being set up i'll send around the link so there's no needs anymore, in particular for those actually who live in Australia to stay up long nights or around midnight. And um, in addition to that, next week, we're going to um, hear from Todd Hutchison about high performance teams. An interesting part about Todd is he's also a certified DISC practitioner. So profiling actually individuals in terms of um, personal traits and so forth, that will actually be an interesting insight from someone who's been um, yeah, born and raised actually in the, in the environment of PMI and then actually moved into the legal project management space. And these days also being the chairman of the International Institute of Legal Project Management will be an interesting chat. And, and then last but not least, Helga, your um, turn to actually compare how LPM differs between in-house and, and external law firms. I mean, since you've seen it all, if I may say that actually, um, from joint uh, great times at El Novi to Barclays and these days again actually out there in private practice and uh, so we look forward to your um, to your insights and observations and uh, yeah otherwise I mean in times of COVID-19 stay healthy mm -hmm. stay safe for those actually live in in environments that um, yeah that uh, require that and the and I wish you actually over here it's evening for those who still have the day ahead. I wish you a productive day. Those who have already actually closed the books, I wish you a great evening. Um, thanks for joining. All the best. Thank See you, you Steve. Thank and you. Do you mind sharing that Thank slide you. deck with the participants? Yes. I will do that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.